do I want to say about traumatic brain injury? Traumatic brain injury is the most misunderstood injury, I think, that's out there. It can be small or big, and then the aftermath that one encounters after the injury is just amazing because it's watching each system shut down and then restart again, if you're so lucky. Amber, Amber probably struggled the most with memory challenges. She too had very severe memory challenges. She was a college student at the time of her injury and she couldn't remember lectures. She'd read materials over and over and over and still have no idea of what she read. It was very frustrating to her. When David was um, a little boy, he was the most cautious child I have ever seen. I mean, very cautious. Even when he was starting to walk, he would crawl and just hang on to things and very, uh, he didn't really want to do anything that was risky. We have a lot to be thankful for because she has done very, very well. I feel like God answered those prayers. I give Amy back to him for whatever he wants to do with her life. I think he has special plans for her. Kelly is an exception. Um, in a lot of ways, her attitude from the very beginning was one of good humor and courage. There was nothing that I ever suggested that Kelly poo-pooed or said, I won't try. For Adora, she believed she would be a month. She said, I just needed to go home. I'll be fine, just one month and I'll be out of here. I'll be walking, I'll be returning to my former life and I'll be able to take care of my cats. That was her main goal, is to take care of a cat again. <laughs> the whole thing in the beginning is that they need to survive. They need to get past that critical stage. I remember just before his accident, he took me to the Marne Raceway and we went around the S-curve in Grand Rapids and we were clipping right along and I'm sort of hanging on and I'm, we made it to the raceway and I said to him, David, I said, make sure your heart's right with the Lord. I says, because you're going to die in this car if you keep up like this. And three weeks later, I got the call. I think I was going around a corner probably too fast. I really don't remember the accident all that well. Um, it was the start of a three-month coma. Basically, I woke up in the hospital and I was like, what? I thought it was a dream, totally. I was rounding a little curve on the expressway, so I couldn't see. I couldn't see the traffic backed up, and I came right upon stop traffic. I'd always speed on the road right before I got home and just getting going like 80. Apparently I lost control, which is bound to happen. And I hit a tree with the passenger side of the car. I was the only one inside. The third time that she called, the sheriff answered the phone. And uh, Kent County Sheriff saying that the girls had been in a very bad accident. Both girls were unconscious. Uh, somebody stopped my phone and I knew I couldn't stop and inside I brought a bad pattern to hit the car in front of me but to avoid hitting him I went to the side and the truck and from the side and I think I was just in a car just screwing around going too fast and the passenger side wheels went into the ditch, sucked me, um, sucked me in. 
I went into a fresh alfalfa field and it shot me out and I flipped front end over back end five times and I, I was airborne. I hit the ground five times within an eighth of a mile. So um, you do the math. This is a model of the brain, about life size. It's fairly easy to take it apart. It's going to be a lot harder to put together after you've had an injury to the brain. With working with the traumatic brain injury population, not everyone will survive. A lot of the injuries we see are because of risk-taking behavior, drinking and driving being one of the biggest ones, which leads you down to things like racing cars at high rates of speed and not having good judgment. Some are the result of things that are purely accidental, bad road conditions, people driving too fast, slick icy roads, not being able to stop in time, being sidetracked, talking on cell phone and eating and drinking and doing other things other than just driving the car like they should be doing. I wish that, like driver's ed courses, that part of that was going into a Mary Freebed or a Hope Network and seeing that it isn't just an accident that you're sick for a while and you get up and you're done. It's not like breaking a leg or breaking an arm. You, when you get done with this, you are not the same person you were before it happened. And I don't know if you can understand that at 16 or 17 years old, how it changes absolutely everything. I obviously don't think I can even speak. I was like blah, blah, blah. Nobody really knew what I was saying. So I didn't know I could, could not walk. Just all those little things that you think you know how to do. Then when it comes down to it, when you try to do them, you can't. There's a recognition that the things that we work on with people are things that you know, four and five year olds are learning to do developmentally that 18 to 35, sometimes older than that, those people are having to relearn to do it. Had, had to learn how to walk, swallow, um, tie my shoes. My grandmother showed me how to tie my shoes. To me, it's like, it's a constant struggle because you take two steps forward, three steps back, then three steps forward, two steps back, and it's a constant juggling act to get my life back. My voice was my best friend. My mom told me that anything. And then, of all things, when the wreck happened, my voice was the one thing was dear to me. It was the one thing that got taken away. I can tell you how much I cried about it. And it's a struggle. It usually takes longer to recover than people expect. There are usually more issues involved than they expect. For example, having to go retake a driving test. It's hard for people to recognize sometimes that they have more impairments than they think they do. And they have to go through more hoops to regain independence that they are used to. This is the tracheotomy scar, um, where... Battle scar? Yeah, battle scar where um, a tube goes down your throat and uh, you receive oxygen, oxygen through that so you can breathe. Oh, I have a battle scar here and a feeding tube that was placed here. We will put in a tracheostomy in through the trachea. That way we can uh, effectively clear secretions for them because they don't have the ability to do that because of their brain injury. If we know somebody's gonna be on the ventilator for a long time, like a closed head injury, we will try and get a tracheostomy placed because with the tracheostomy, we can just take the ventilator off them when they have the sufficient respiratory drive and respiratory muscles to ventilate on their own. I still say when you see that trach scar, that is a badge of courage because all the things that had to happen for that person to survive and the life force that was fighting within that person that brought them out of coma, that brought them to the initial rehab, 
to hope shows that there is some purpose out there. It's something beyond, that, beyond which we don't understand. But that force drives these kids, and that's a powerful force. I think the most difficult thing would be having them gain an awareness of their deficits and how it's going to tie into their former lives and whether or not they can resume some of the roles that they had previously. A lot of the population that we work with are young people generally aged 18 to about 35 and a majority of them are male just based on males in that category take more risks and a lot of the times people that we work with have varying levels of brain injury, whether it's a concussion, whether it's um, a truly traumatic brain injury, or whether it's something somewhere in between on that continuum. from because um, why have this urge to go fast? I always have. Go! Yeah, at the end of those commercials when they're saying this was done by a professional driver on a closed course, I always thought I was a really professional driver, but I just, I was never on the closed course. Instead, I was rolling end over end through a hay field. One of the guys that I've worked with in the past is Dave Tubergen. He's a young guy that had a pretty significant injury following a multiple rollover accident. And um, his injury was severe enough that he needed to be airlifted to a hospital. It was his best friend who called me, and he was uh, just hysterical. And he said, they're airlifting David. And I said, you know, no, the first thing I said, Paulie was just crying and crying, and, and I said, I knew, I said, is he dead? And Paul, he said, I don't think so, but they're airlifting him now. The majority of patients who are transported with traumatic brain injury are young men who are involved in car accidents. The way I look at it is we provide an opportunity to, uh, to save a life. There's only so much we can do. We, the Aeromed team and the helicopter is just one link in a chain. You know, I know they, they talk about the golden hour. I fly as fast as I can every time. I fly as fast as I can going, coming, and as safely as we can primarily. That's the most important thing. I remember when he was first injured, and they allowed me to put music in his room. I'd put Nora Jones on. I loved Nora Jones. Come away with me in the night. And it's this most beautiful song, and if you listen to it, it's almost like, it's almost like a mother's prayer to, to a kid to, to come back. I'm sure most parents have said, um, it's, it's not you usually, it's the other drivers. And boy, is that a true statement. And uh, a lot of times, I was that other driver that people had to watch out for. I had a speaker box come from the back of my car. And when the speaker box, I had the back seats folded down. When the speaker box came, it uh, put a hole probably about this big in my head. And uh, they had to wait like two years for much bone to uh, your bone kind of forms layer over layer, and I had a hole, and they wanted to see how much of that hole would close up before they went and put a plate in. And so they just put a piece of titanium and ABS plastic in my head a couple months ago, so. And sometimes I get a little miffed because I'll say to David, now that he's with us again and can really understand what I say to him, I say, do you, do you remember do you remember crawling on the floor or, or trying to drop a ball and 
you couldn't even make your hand grab the ball. I said, you remember all that? No. I said, you remember anything out of the hospital? No. And I thought, well, I do. And your father does. And your sisters. And your grandparents. It was hard. <laughs> I like to look at cognition as much like the universe um, and language is, as like the earth. It's a very important part of that universe, but it's not all of it. Okay, Jane, let's take another bite of ice cream. For example, someone learning to eat again, um, we take for granted how easy it is for us to pick up a spoon, scoop the ice cream, and take that bite. But if you think about all of the components of that, what, what, it, what the spoon feels like in your hand, the movement from the ice cream to your mouth, what that ice cream feels like in your mouth, oh, um, we, we take for granted and, and where it needs to be in your mouth to swallow. Open now. Open now. Do you feel it? Kind of bring your shoulders down. Bring your head down. Part of what I do is connect the language part of cognition with the action part of cognition um, and bring it together to make it a functional, um, a functional activity, such as eating. Before my crash, I was 24, living in Chicago. I'd moved to Chicago right after I had graduated from college with a bachelor's in communication and lived there on my own in a studio apartment in the city. One of the most frustrating things for me has been myself because I've probably sabotaged myself, not being aware of it, but fighting against the idea that there is anything wrong with me. Well, obviously, there is, or I wouldn't be here. <laughs> uh, when we first met, Kelly uh, was barely able to sit on a mat table. In fact, when she did sit on it, she'd have to hold on for balance. She didn't have any kind of protective reaction, so if she started to fall, she couldn't even begin to catch herself. She could walk, but it took her, let me remember, about 35 minutes to walk 170 feet. Kelly used to get lost. She had what we call problems with topographical orientation. So she'd go down the hallway and all of a sudden we'd hear this big laugh and uh, I'm lost again, somebody get me. Uh, she, it, simple things, she couldn't find her way around. She couldn't roll over, she couldn't scoot up and down in a bed. Even simple movements that, that we take for granted, um, like turning or twisting, were enough to knock her over. I, that's a double-edged sword because, yes, one has to, I, at least I've had to readjust, but is it good or bad? No, it just is what it is. Twist and shout! Twist and shout! I love what I'm doing now. I love the people that I work with now. I'm signing in with, I'm signing in with Asia. I'm working for a preschool in Grand Rapids. So I'm working with little three and four year, and some five year olds. I'm just one of them. I'm down at their level and they don't see it as any different, which is great because you just can't imagine how powerful it is to be able to expose these young children to the differences that are out there in the world and have them be at ease with it. You don't want one person giving their opinion, you want a team of them. It often takes a, co a dedicated group of people working closely together, checking their own egos at the door, and making sure that the welfare of the patient comes first. And that means working together, agree on what the goals are, and involve the patient and the family in that process. Make sure that you work on what's important for them, not what's just interesting for you.
Patients with traumatic brain injury have a lot of things that need to be evaluated and assessed early on in their recovery um, to give them the best possible prognosis for recovering um, lost skills due to that injury. I have a red cone in my hand. I need you to open your eyes and look right at that cone. Good. Now I want you to try to follow it with your eyes, okay? I'm going to move it over. You follow it. It's been estimated that over 50% of of a patients that have suffered um, neurological condition have disturbances in their vision. Okay, Jane, see this cone? Follow it with your eyes. Good. Reach out and stack it up. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Good job. Mm -hmm. Very good. Problems with your vision can um, significantly impact balance, coordination, decision making. Um, it's like asking somebody to summarize a novel if they've only read page 20 and 82. Good, 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 good. Excellent job. It's very important to um, make sure that you don't fatigue the patient too much. In a traumatic brain injury patient or acquired brain injury, um, visual skills are very fatiguing. Being involved with the patient's family is huge. We do most of our family education, um, really intense family education within the first two or three weeks that the patient's here. We keep them as involved in their therapy as possible. But I watched him every step of the way from, from staring, just staring and slumped in a wheelchair and no response and the trach uh, covered and uh, trying to see if he would respond to us uh, for weeks on end. It is very difficult to watch families mourn and grieve their loved one who has not died, but has changed so drastically that their lives will never be the same. In the beginning, Kelly's mom was in the PT gym every day and she was a part of our sessions. And what it allowed us to do is create an environment for Kelly where she felt safe and secure, even though I was pushing her into doing a lot of things that she was afraid of or, or not even capable of doing. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. All my family, every single member of my family was undoubtedly there for me and without question, the most supportive piece of this colossal puzzle. Good job, sweetheart. Look at those eyes. Good job. I love you. Good job. I think that speech therapy is a little bit different than some of the other therapies like occupational or physical or therapeutic recreation because it's, it's quite often um, an intimate setting. It's, it's usually one-on-one -on -one in, in a quiet office and um, we do a lot of talking. There's a lot of loss and disability and when people are able to do things they can say haha -ha, and then I can say I knew you could do it the whole time. We all need to communicate. Um, it's just a very basic part of life and if someone has trouble doing that um, it can really have an effect on their self-esteem and very high levels of frustration at times. Here we are. Let me, show, let me put this down. Goal. Goal. There you go, because we're listening for the G sound the most. Good job. Gate. Good. Good job. How do you help a person that's lost a lot and still let them feel like they have a say in their life and allow them to be their own person? Cookie. I'll take it. Good, we got both of them. Okay, we're moving on to a k sound. In therapy, all patients struggle with the same issues. They are fighting loss of independence. They're fighting loss of thinking skills. And it's a struggle. It usually takes longer to recover than people expect. And then here's two, cake. There you go, you got both of them, all right. 
Well, the first real key to me that she was hurt as critically as she was, was I was assigned a chaplain who stood by me. So I knew at that time it was extremely serious. And I, I just kept praying that Amy would be all right, that somehow um, she would pull through. And one day when I walked in the hospital room, she had not come out of her coma yet, but when I walked in the room, she said, hi, mom and it was the most precious words I'd ever heard in my life. actually. <laughs> yeah. Living by yourself, yeah. And you have any friends move in with you? Well, I thought about it, but someday I'd like to live with a friend. Actually, my ultimate goal in life, like this is what I hope to aspire to, mm -hmm. would be to own my own little house and have my own little dog. And if I had a husband too, that would be nice. Yeah. And or if I had a child, that would be nice. But those are two things that might happen. But what I really want is just to own my own little house and have my own little dog. Making a cup of tea seems like a very common, very easy job. But if you try to sequence it, you, as a person, have to have a physical control to be able to move and pick up that cup, warm up the water, pour water, mix milk, sugar, whatever you need to. It seems very simple, but if you cannot think that what are you doing, what is the sequence, how to organize this sequence, how to execute this sequence, I think it's a very hard job. Occupational therapy is a, a segment of rehab, and we use occupation for therapy. All right, Jane, you know what I want you to do today? Go to the kitchen. Yeah, we're going to open that cupboard and get a cup, and then get the milk from the fridge, pour that milk, and bring it to the table. Okay. Now, your occupation could be like getting dressed, making a sandwich for yourself. Your occupation could be playing golf. Your occupation could be, you know, taking a shower. So anything that you do from the time you wake up to the time you go back to bed is occupation. Oh, 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 oh. What, what, what are you trying to do? You gotta get a little closer as far as you can. Otherwise, we're both gonna be on the floor. That's good. <laughs> You're funny. You are dealing with people who are suffering from oh uh, pain, oh. people with no like memory, maybe no sequencing. They cannot even understand where they are. And you start from there and you bring them back to life and they can go back to work. I think that's a very rewarding job. All right, try again. That's good, that's good. Are you gonna bring the whole cup? Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, 
I actually really enjoyed both of my boyfriends that I had at that time. One boyfriend was definitely one that uh, him and I like went skydiving, as you could say. We went skiing trips, we went on all these different adventurous kind of a lifestyle together and then my other boyfriend was more like a serious, serious deal. My friends in high school, we did a lot of rebellious things, you know, we partied and, and all this stuff, but that, that was then, this is now, you know. You clap your hands at the back. I am very tough on my clients. I uh, believe that 50% is their own effort, but 50% or even more is really what the therapist brings to it and what you put into them. And I believe input equals output. So as much as I can drive them and put into them and not just pampering, but really pushing them is how I've gotten the results I've gotten over the years. I'm very thankful that this happened because um, I, I, I can continue on from this point knowing where I'm going to be going, what I'm going to be doing. I have a better um, idea of what I want to do and that would never have been possible. Young men especially find it very difficult if they have problems with their walking and being able to make that trust factor of um, relying on somebody else to assist them. We look for the best long-term outcomes. We address all kinds of mobility, including um, their access to the bathroom, being able to transfer to the toilet is a huge issue um, dealing with independence. Patients want to take themselves to the bathroom. They don't want to have to rely on somebody else to be able to assist them. One of the hardest things that we have to tell a lot of our patients is they're not safe to go by themselves. They have to call and ask for help. Stand up tall. Good. People usually overestimate their abilities uh, in the early stages, and they don't want to rely on somebody else to assist them. Like I say to my client, it's a muscle and a bone, and if you work them, you will see the progress or it will change. I worked a long time with Adora because of her severe car accident. A big part of the problem was that she had movement problems. She couldn't move. She was very uncoordinated. My name is Adora, and I had a brain injury four years ago. And now my voice and you hear heads this table. Adora, yeah, voice. A lot of voice therapy with Adora. Before I sang, and my voice was my voice. Now my voice is things like this. My voice is my art. My art is how I sing now. Before her accident in high school, she was a member of this uh, choral group. She was working with the vocal coach. Uh, singing was a large part of her life before her injury. Boyfriend at the time listened to a tape of me singing from back then and he had the headphones on and he was like and at that point I knew to him especially 
I found my voice somewhere down my voice. I found that I wasn't a person anymore. This is an example of something I did after my wreck. And it's a pretty good example of the work I do now. Who can tell what's there? But it's distorted and kind of fun and disorganized and messy like my place. But people have said that my paintings capture so much personality of the person and that reflects another thing about my wreck. I wreck me more in tune with what's going on inside of people. It took a long time to gain trust in us and to develop a relationship where she was just wanted to get out of here, didn't want to build, initially I thought want to build real close relationships, which for her it was just a temporary move. The big start of it all was when I wanted to get out to my van, Earth. So, I had a harness on me to tie me down on my wheelchair because I was trying to get out. So I took an hour trying to and I had this thing, and then I quietly wheeled them all to the doors and outside and got up to run to the thing outside. And it must take one or two steps when I fell. guys, it's been a while since we've all seen each other. The I've, Breakfast um, Club the is a group of 20-somethings that have been going through rehab around the same time. And so we've had different struggles. Got my driver's license back finally. And then I went out oh, and I got my chauffeur's license. So now I can cart people around, but they really don't feel too easy riding with <laughs> me. Which I don't understand why. I don't know uh, what career I'm on, but preferably something in like the management field. Just kind of an opportunity for a group of us to get together and talk about our situations, our feelings, and our frustrations, to kind of have a voice. And it's wonderful that they can talk with one another because like so many illnesses or disabilities, when you have it, you, you're the only one you know that's ever had that before and you're struggling with this and it's wonderful to be able to talk with other people who have been there and can offer you some insight and not just from a clinician that maybe has ideas but these people have really been through it and they can say yeah I, I struggled with with that too and this worked for me or you might try that and it really helps when it comes from their peers in this situation it takes a very very long time to feel like you have a voice and you're being heard Check your pupils here. I'm going to shine a really bright light right in your eye. If the patient survives, it can be a very, very long road to find out how much they will recover. Excellent. And the uncertainty of that is, is often very frustrating. And it's different in that way than a lot of other types of trauma where, for instance, a spinal cord patient is dealing primarily with physical problems. 
and after uh, a few months or a year, it's pretty well cut and dried what deficit or what remaining physical impairment they will have. Okay, Bill, look up. There you go. Whereas with a brain injury, things can change or improve in some cases for several years, and early on, it's very hard to predict how much a person may recover. I've seen some pretty remarkable testimonies to the human spirit of people trying to recover and trying to put their lives back together. This brain was given to me after my injury and What's, it's so relevant to me, and what's amazing is that the brain controls absolutely every area. And when you damage one part of it, it affects everything you do. I did have to deal with severe guilt after the accident, though, because I was the one driving. It wasn't even my young teenage daughter, where usually it's the teenager that has that. And I never had an accident before. This was the first one. Four years. Okay, good job. I was finally one of the regular 20-somethings, and then all of a sudden, crash comes, and it changes my life. And I don't know if there's any rhyme or reason, and I can't change history. So it is what it is. Now I can really drive slow, and it's okay with me if somebody has to pass me, I can just let them go. I don't have any more of that. I need to get there now for no real reason, drive like I used to. I think he had his epiphany, and I think he realizes that he can die. Oh yeah, I was pregnant at the time, and it blew his mind away that I could do things pregnant that he couldn't do as a young adult. <laughs> I had a wonderful therapist at the time who knew there was a reason to work hard. She told me that I have to work hand in hand. Well, hopefully a patient is able to demonstrate their personality, first of all. So whatever level of humor they had before, we always hope we see that. If they have a dry sense of humor, or if they were jovial before, we hope that that emerges. And that's one reason after my wreck, I'm so happy and self-confident, even though I have this. I really was angry with God but I think it was a good thing. I think God allowed it to happen because my life was going this way and then all of a sudden, my, after my injury, I was going this way. So, the why me? And you know, in my, in my mind, there, there isn't an answer for that. It's, it is what it is and Guess what? You have to deal with it. If you want to live in this life, you have to deal with it. I know I can do good things for my time because therapy told me if you apply yourself, you can be worth a while.
Nico, you got both of them. All right.